Well, hello, hello, everyone. I hope you can hear us. Uh, as usual, um, a confirmation uh, by any of our viewers that we are audible and uh, we can commence the housekeeping. Hi, Dustin. I can see you in the chat and I can see you in the green room. <laughs> so, um, a confirmation, please. That's uh, not too much to ask for. Is anybody out there? Yay! Hello, hello. Good. All sounds good. Well, uh, happy Monday, everyone. And uh, let's go through the quick housekeeping. And welcome to Demystifying Post-Production, Compositing 3D into Videos and Stills. And um, I would like to share my screen and, uh, first of all, show you where you can see all our events. And I'm going to add this to the stream. And you can see you go to the maxon.net slash whatever language slash events, and you will see all the upcoming events. So you're always uh, in, in the know, or you can find various events based on region, date, or any kind of search. For example, when is Dustin uh, going to have another show? Right? Or when is Lionel? And of course, when is Noseman? And um, uh, you can watch our shows on the Maxon Training Team uh, YouTube channel uh, or the Red Giant Training Team channel. We are simulcasting on uh, many platforms. Uh, I wouldn't know all the others from the top of my head, but nonetheless, we are. So you can catch this recorded later on, just in case you were wondering. Now, um, let's uh, talk about certification. If you do want to become a certified pro user, or a certified trainer, you can go to the maximum certifications and read all the appropriate information about that. And uh, the, you just search for certifications, learn, and you go to certification right here, and it will bring you to this page. Now, the design and animation tour is uh, ongoing, and uh, you can see all the dates and who's presenting all these beautiful cartoon people. Uh, it's going to be very exciting, so uh, follow along with that. And then finally, we have our monthly exclusives. And I think, I think, where are they? Um, do, 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 do. It's, I'm looking at the links. There you go. I'm putting the banner on here. Uh, Max on merch store and so forth. And I can always copy this and paste it in the chat. So here it is, pasted in the chat. And for this month, uh, the end of May, for all the shows, ATTs and DPPs and all that, uh, you use the code COMPOSITING3D, all caps, no gaps. That rhymes. All caps, no gaps. That's uh, very much 80s rap. Um, and uh, yes, do I have anything else uh, to say here? You can get a free swag over here. Go to that page, choose something, and you only pay for shipping. Now, as far as the uh, digital animation tour, go, dat, go to dat. Uh, that will be the address to go and uh, find that. And uh, now let's do some introductions here. I have my blurb. Lionel Visidomini is a master trainer at Maxon and a teacher instructor in France at various training centers and schools. He has worked for many years in, broadcast, in, in the broadcast industry and for advertising agencies. Specializing in motion design, Lionel loves anything that moves and can be rendered, tracked, or edited. And uh, Lionel offers several training courses on Udemy. And I have this link go on Udemy and uh, use this code here. Maxon underscore DPP underscore May, or CAPS, to get a hefty 75% discount. And I have to say that his courses are absolutely fantastic. And uh, just in case you were wondering, Mr. Domini means master conqueror, according to my Google search. So he master, he's a master trainer, and he conquers and tames the hard challenges in motion graphics. I have two mice, one over here, one over here. So I'll be looking around and moving around. 
Now for our second guest, he doesn't need special introductions, but I'll do them anyway. Dustin Valkema is a Maxon certified master trainer, a 3D journalist and composite photographer with over 15 years of industry experience. He loves cosplay as well, in case you didn't know. He's now focused on education and mentorship through his company, CG Hacks. Uh, there you go, CG Hacks. That's his website. And uh, youtube.com at CG Hacks is his YouTube channel. And um, where was I? I was reading my, my blurb. Okay, uh, CG Hacks uh, provides VFX overlays, 3D textures, and material libraries and other resources to bridge the gap between two dimensional and three dimensional workflows. Dustin's passion for helping others stems from his own experiences with failure. And I always emphasize that. You learn from your mistakes, you become better. You don't learn from your mistakes, you just... I was uh, going to say something, but I can't say these <laughs> words. This is <laughs> uh, rated for children. And uh, learning from them, that's the most important thing. He believes that with a bit of creative tenacity and a willingness to learn, anything is possible in the world of digital art. In Dutch, Valk means falcon. So the bird of prey of uh, Cinema 4D and Photoshop and photography and many others, knowledge. Excellent. In the background, we have our producer, Carl Johnstone. And uh, yeah, uh, Johnstone, um, I think stone is not the stone. I think it's the town. So from Johnstown. So Carl, are you from Johnstown? I do not know about that. Excellent. So the show will commence with uh, some fantastic uh, projection work that Lionel Visdomini is going to show us, um, which I myself find very interesting. Without further ado, uh, let Lionel take the screen. And I'm going to switch to this one, turn off the banner and your screen. I'm going to add it. There you go. I managed to do that without totally destroying everything. I think I was clicking over, Kyle. Sorry. All right. Thank you, Nozman. So, yes, I'm going to show you today uh, a very old technique, uh, which is called uh, 2.5D projection camera mapping. Uh, and it's maybe the oldest trick in the CGI book. Uh, and we will see other examples. And for this one, I just wanted to show, uh, this is a very old uh, tutorial, my very first tutorial actually, and a very old uh, work I did for uh, the French network, Canon Plus. And th this was a teaser for the TV series, uh, Hannibal, the TV show Hannibal. And because we didn't have time nor money as usual, and we couldn't cast, um, uh, Matt Mickelson to do something for us. Uh, I took a picture from the internet and I just uh, projected it on uh, mesh. And it worked uh, very, very well. I was very happy with it. And that, that was the subject, my very first tutorial, almost 12 years ago, I think. And this technique, I'm going to show it to you, but with a twist because I'm going to, well, you'll see. Anyway, so two and a half D projection is just a fancy word for um, saying that we're going to project. Uh, so this is the new end result. We're just going to project uh, a picture or photography onto a 3D mesh. So here we can see we have uh, this young woman. And actually, if I just exit the camera, you will see the trick, which is some kind of, uh, I mean, really uh, some a hack because she looks all right until she doesn't. And here it's just, uh, <laughs> it's just horrible because you can see we just project the face from a camera. So we have a camera here, which is literally a cinema projector, a movie projector. So it's pro projecting the picture onto the 3D mesh. And it works very well if you choose the right angle. So you can do some kind of animation like that huh? very simply. And this is very, very simple because I didn't do the core region render and so on. We will talk about it, but I didn't do it. And we can do something like that. And you can see it, it just works. It's uh, pretty nice. And because this is a photography, 
the render is rather nice too because there is no render meaning that we're just using the, um, the luminance channel there is no actual light and so on uh, so if you want to do a very cheap and fast effect this is the final render and you can see it's fast so the hair are a bit crummy because i didn't um, you'll see why uh, because I could just use uh, this, use the hair from the picture. Maybe we have we have less of the 3D effect. Still a work in progress. So anyway, it's a very easy way to to skip render time uh, and to achieve something nice uh, really quickly. And I think uh, Nozman will, will show you, show us to, um, in a while uh, other technique with that because uh, it's a very very old trick all right yes i can see your lionel please show the mesh with that projection very simple you can see here and if i just do nq this is the mesh okay so i'm going to show show you very quickly how i, I did it so let's go what did i use for a mesh i just went to the library because you have here so human female and we have this character. So let's download it. So everyone has it just on the library. And we're going to do a few things. So we could pose it like that, turn the head and so on. It's really rigged, pretty nice, but I don't want that. I want to do something very simple. So I'm going to delete all the rigging. And here the head alignment. And here I'm going to delete the skin modifier and all the tags that I just don't care. All those tags here are for just the, um, the weighting, the skinning and so on. I don't need them. And actually, I just want to do a portrait. So I don't need the whole body. So we have, for example, the arms. I don't need them. I don't need the eye reflection. I don't need the trousers nor the shirt all right that's already much more simplified huh? and i started from that okay this is the base model and the trick here is i'm going to use ai i'm going to use table diffusion to create um, a nicer render of that which is going to be very easy to project onto the mesh because it's coming from the mesh you'll see so let's create the shot i'm going to switch everything to standard renderer this is the idea uh, this is not this is not really photorealistic render because we're going to cheat all the way so let's go to standard which is very fast huh? not photorealistic but very fast let's change also the color management which i put on open color IO by default. And here I don't need that. Okay, so now I'm going to create a camera and the camera is going to be very important. So I have to take care of that shot because it's going, everything is going to depend on the, on the, the shot. So my camera will be a 80 millimeter to make a portrait. Also, I'm going to the render settings. I'm going to change the output to something square. So 280, 1280 by 1280. And now I'm just going to frame the shot. Okay, so I did something very simple like that. Okay, we have a tiny bit of hair here. So actually the hair, I'm going to do something better than the what I did. Uh, which one is it? So you can use here the solo button to, um, to see what's going on. And here you can even use the solo automatic. So this is the one, yeah, the hair mid. Maybe I don't need it. I'm going to hide it. All right, so simpler hair, but it will be easier. Okay, now I have done that. The only thing I'm going to do is a render. Let's activate the subdivision surface. If I activate the render, we have this and it doesn't look like, like much because um, it's just a starting point. But here the interesting thing uh, is we can use the feature of the face uh, 
uh, the placement of the eyes, of the nose, of the mouth, and so on. And I'm going to, to make it prettier. Okay, so let's make a proper render from this. I'm going to save it as a JPEG. Yeah, JPEG, perfect. And let's put it in the project in the here, my uh, base render. So I have already done a lot of tests. Let's call it final. Okay, and now what I'm going to do is use this very same image and reproject it back on the character. Why should I do that? Because I'm going to transform this image. So this is the uh, one of the interesting part here of my workflow. I'm going to use stable, stable diffusion. So stable diffusion is a image generative AI. I'm sure you've heard of it. There is a lot of fear about this, and yes, it's something we can be afraid of. But it's a very interesting uh, artistic tool also because you can use it for not as a uh, um, final end like uh, everyone does, but as a step for something else. So here, this is my final result. And I can just generate again now. And it's going to output very fast my uh, result. So let's see what's, yeah, what's going on. So you see it's, uh, it's uh, creating the image. Huh? And as you can see, it's very, very, very close from the original image. This is because I used some trick, uh, which I call control net. Let me just show you if I don't do that, what's going to happen. So I won't explain uh, everything here because this is not the topic, but this is the picture. And here, if I use another model, for example, uh, we could use a uh, realistic vision. Let's make it load. Every time I will have a different portrait. Sharing the information I just put here, woman with short hair, portrait from a third quarter and so on. But if I use, so let's go back to my edge of realism. If I use my trick here to use the control net unit, which is going to take the original image, and you can see it here, and then it's going to extract the facial feature of the character, the eye, the eyebrow, and so on. And on top of that, I am also using a line art extractor, which is going to give me a very clean render because it, it is 3D, it's perfect for that. And it's going to match the feature of that kind of generic uh, woman character onto the character. So when I enable those two, and I, if I go back here, now I'm going to have almost the same uh, picture but with the pose and everything corresponding. And if I just use another seed, I would have something else, which can be not as interesting. You're just going to browse for ideas like that. So I'm going to use this one anyway. I just wanted to show you if I use a different seed. You see, very similar, but different. She could be blonde and so on. Okay, so. Uh, I saved this image. This is the end of the AI part because I don't want to spend too much time on, on this, huh? but just give an idea what we can do with this. Okay, what I, what I did, I saved this image. And uh, let's see it in my image. We can see it here. And I have made a bunch of different images. Different style. Huh? just to give you an idea what you can do with that. You see, always the same, but different, blonde, dark haired and so on. And this is the one I chose for in the end. Okay, so this image, I put it in my project and we can find it here, it's a PSD. So what I'm going to do here is to use, uh, well, we could use a prediction man 
well, let's use it. Projection Man is a very old tool inside Semaphore for 2D and a half projection. Okay, so I'm just going to unlock it. And if I want, if you want to find it, you will find it here. It's Projection Man. Where is it? Projection Man. You see, it's hidden. It's always been there. Nobody cares about it, but it's been there for all the version of Cinema 40. So Projection Man, and I'm going to dock it there. I'm, this camera, which is uh, the base camera, I'm going to make a copy of it. Let's call it work. Okay, and we're going to take here our uh, head, which is the main feature, um, the main mesh, as you can see. This is this. So we're going to take the head here. I'm going to right-click New Projection Camera. Let's load a bitmap. And there's a caveat here. You have to use uh, PSD. So the image I just um, I just took this one. No, this not. Where is it? Well, this one could work. Uh, yeah, I forgot to copy it. Sorry about that. Uh, it's uh, in my. Right. What did, what did I put it? Okay, it doesn't matter. I'm going to take this one because it's going to work as well. So let's take this picture instead. Huh? Ah. Okay, I'm going to take this picture. That, that doesn't matter. Uh, it should be a PSD. Um, otherwise, production man is not going to work. So let's put it, open it. And I'm going to leave it as a default. And it's going to project the, um, the picture on, on it. Okay, so I really need to find the, the original image. Huh? Because uh, this, this is a test that uh, I did with another camera, so it's not going to work. And actually, I cannot even, I'm sorry about that. I'm a bit confused. So I'm going to go back to this character. Well, it's a good example because I said in the, in the beginning that the camera you're going to use is very important because this is the camera which is going to determine everything afterward. So the real mistake here is um, this camera, this shot is slightly different from this one. So the image I generated cannot match. Okay, so I really need to make a render from this one to have the, fi the final image, and then I'm going to use it on this um, this one here. So I'm going back to, I'm going just to clean all this. So we are back to our uh, original character, as you can uh, as you can see. Lionel, and can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um... I was uh, told by a user, by David, the image you're looking for is in that folder at the top of the list called 2.psd. I don't know. Um, I sort of missed that. I don't know. But anyhow, I just want to uh, point that out. All right. Yeah. Anyway, I went back to my, uh, because this is the one I corrected. As you can see, the, the texture is very weird because I changed a lot of things. So. We're back here to this one, which is the final shot I used. And here I can use uh, my um, here. So let's take my uh, the head, new projection camera. And you said, yes, it's. Um, uh, 2.psd, the one on the top. Could that be the one? Oh, yes, yes, of course. <laughs> yes. Uh, I think David is paying attention. We should give him a code to get uh, 150,000 uh, T-shirts, if that's correct. Otherwise, we're going to take away the code. All right. So here I choose the wrong camera. 
this is just a bit, uh, yeah. Head, new projection camera, load bitmap to PSD. Damn it. I can say something funny or I can just let you boil uh, in that mess. I don't know what I'm going to do, what I could do now. Uh, maybe do a little dance. <laughs> Take your time, Lano. Everyone is expecting us to overrun anyway. Yes, uh, yes, this is a big mess because, uh, yeah, this is not the right, uh, I cannot show you with the, this original image. So here, yes, I'm going to use uh, this one instead, uh, which is one, one of the earlier image I made. Uh, I so uh, let's, uh, can I ask something um, very, very quickly? So uh, the, the idea is that you create a render from Cinema 4D, a standard render. You okay. use that to inform the AI uh, about the angle and the camera and all that. So when it creates an image, uh, they will be very close in the way they look. So when you project it, uh, it's going to align. Is that the general concept? Yes, exactly. That's exactly okay. the idea. Okay. And this is why it doesn't work now because I... I, make a, I made a mess with my file. Okay, Just bad boy. Be, bad boy. There you go. S slap on the wrist. All right, keep the going. Camera and the camera is not perfectly matching. So, yes, it's, uh, uh, it's bad. So, uh, I guess I'll go back. Well, I'm obliged to, to use this one after all. This is the one I uh, used. Okay. And I'm going to use the image I created uh, from Stable Diffusion, this one. So let's save it. Uh, by the way, uh, Stable Diffusion is just a way for you to get an image, in this particular case, that will match the aspect ratio, the, the general uh, look and dimensions of uh, the information you provide. If you have uh, a model or a photo of a person and you match the camera angle, you can actually use someone's photo to do the projection. So what Lionel is showing yes. uh, isn't only possible using some sort of uh, AI. It's uh, just a, a, a way to produce an image which aligns with the, the 3D. So yeah, let's uh, continue. Yes, because on the Hannibal shot I just showed earlier, this is the picture of an actual person, Matt Mikkelsen. And that just, this way I didn't have to, to model the, really the whole thing. It was just a simplified, uh, just a simplified um, Matt Mikkelsen. So this is the image. I'm going to put it inside Photoshop to save it as a Photoshop image. Okay, so let's save it as a Photoshop. Don't forget where you save it. Yes. I'm, yeah, and I'm, here, I'm your conscience. I'm your conscience. I'm in the yeah. right. So let's call it final. <laughs> this way. Underscore. I'll... Underscore final. Uh, underscore final, final, really final. final. V3 and so on. <laughs> so now I have the right uh, image. Let's go back here. And because this is the one I created with you um, live, uh, let's save the project so that I'm not going to lose everything and made a make another mess. Base project, base portrait, final also. Yeah, don't do that. Don't ever call anything final. But <laughs> okay, and here we are. Here we are in the end. So I'm going to take the head. And we're going to load the bitmap, which is my final. Here it is. And it it match it it match enough. Huh? It should match better, but it's no problem. It's close enough to show you what I want to do uh, next. Okay, so the next part is very important because you it will be never a perfect match. It can be very, very, very close. This is not that close, but 
it's a good example, I, um, I'd say, because I need to to tweak the, the mesh to make it match. Huh? So I'm going to just deform the mesh, push the vertex and the polygons to make to to fit the actual image. So let's do this. Here, this is my work camera. I'm going to use here the camera, the 2D mode. I'm going to hide the hair also. Let's hide the eyes. And now using my work camera, if I just zoom here with the 2D mode, I can just magnify the whole thing without moving moving the camera. And here I'm going to take my material. Let's go, let's deactivate the reflectance. Quick note, uh, Lionel, quick note. Yes. Uh, just so that users are not confused, the 2D mode navigation uh, instead of moving the camera left or right when you're panning and in and out when you're dollying, what it does, it changes the focal length when you're zooming in and out. Yes. So it's something like a, a two-dimensional zoom like the one you do in Photoshop. Things just become bigger without changing the perspective. And uh, the sideways movement is actually a camera uh, back shift. If you go to the camera object and look at the shifting, you can see it right there where Lionel is uh, pointing. So that's how the two-dimensional uh, navigation works. It's the one that's used in the tracker as well, so things don't change their perspective. Uh, keep so going, this, sir. This way you don't need to move your camera. You should not move anyway. So here it's uh, it's easier. Okay, now let's take the head, huh? and I'm going to polygon mode. Huh? Let's deselect everything. Also, I'm going to switch the display to isoparm. Huh? And I'm going to take here my magnet tool. So the magnet tool is going to let me push the vertex, uh, move the vertex like they were um, well, magnetized. So I can move a whole bunch at the same time. And let's limit the surface. So I'm really going to move localize uh, settings. And here I'm just going to tweak like this. And make it match. So here on the on the ear, I guess we can go a bit like that. And by the way, Lionel is not pulling the image. The image is exactly in the same position through that yes. camera projection. We are modifying the geometry so that it complies to the image. That's what Lionel is doing now. Exactly. And as you can say, if I do something horrible like that, here, we can see the texture underneath doesn't move. Huh? It's projected. Huh? This is the whole idea. So here I just make everything match. Huh? And you shouldn't be shy with that because Okay, this is the teeth, I think, and the tongue. And I'm moving everything so that it's going to cover the image. And this is uh, what you're going to do with um, a real photograph, because a real photograph is going to match even less than that. Um, and you will need to move the whole mesh to, to, to alter the, the facial feature and so on. Here, this is a very simplified version because I'm using the AI trick to generate this, uh, this image, which is very close from the original image. Okay, and I would say there is the nose to move. So here I'm moving and enlarging the cursor using the middle mouse right and left. It's a very handy tool, the, the magnet tool. 
And I guess that will be enough. Wow, well, let's tweak a little bit the mouse. And here, let's switch surface to close the mouse. Okay, so as usual, I should take more, even more time here to tweak everything, uh, to have the corner of the mouth that just match with everything, but I'm doing, uh, just give you the, the broad idea. Okay, I think that's, that's pretty good. Huh? So now if I render the thing, um, I need to go back to this camera. Oh my God, no, but nothing is working uh, today. You haven't had enough uh, coffee. <clears throat> you need to increase your coffee. Uh, go around, let's see what, what the camera is projecting. That's going to give uh, viewers uh, <clears throat> a better understanding. Yeah, let's. Yeah, that's interesting. It looks fine here. We have the projection, meaning that uh, on the other side, it just looks horrible because uh, this is uh, the same projection on that on the face. Huh? So I don't understand why the render is not the same. Huh? As you can see here, it works. We, we have the face onto the character. And if we just restrict the angle and do slight move, slight camera motion like that, it works pretty well. Uh, don't forget that I need to add the eyes on to, to cover more of the face. So why is it? What you can do is, I mean, the, the technique is uh, pretty solid. What you could do is figure out why it's not rendering the same because uh, I can't off the top of my head figure it out myself. Uh, and in, in the next episode, uh, you can tell the users why it's not rendering exactly the same because it should, shouldn't it? Yep. Have you set another render camera or something like that? No, you're rendering over there. I'm rendering the camera final. final. Yep. Yes, that is uh, that is the, interesting. The projection here is the camera mapping. Yep. On the PCAM final. Um, is there a camera shift? Oh, even that shouldn't shouldn't matter. It's because he called it final. That's <laughs> that's why this is. <laughs> no, there's there's no shift here. Uh, Never call it final. Dustin has a looks, point. Looks like it's uh, well. I do have the final project, so I'm going to to use that. And this one here. Let's go back. All right. So because I guess I won't. It's, Is it the UV problem? No, there is no UV. The camera shouldn't care about the UV. Yeah, because this is a camera mapping. So what uh, 3D um, projection man does is create this setup using camera mapping, uh, using this camera, which is going to project onto the character. So this is the case here. It works. And I'm really wondering why Show your other final, show the other, the final file you made for yes. when you uh, were preparing it. Uh, did you use, did you use Projection Man for your own project, that one, or did yes, you do it, it directly? Did. Okay. As you can see here, I have um, all the setup and so on. Sharon, so, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, let me, let me put this up. Sharon, well, I'm, I'm sorry Lionel is having issues, but that's how I feel a lot of the time. <laughs> Why isn't this working? Uh, yeah. Yeah, you just, uh, you know, so, you just stick with it and it's something simple usually. There you go. On the, 
on the final uh, render, uh, the final project, you can see I have my uh, my character like that, and everything sticks and works. And if I use now the work uh, this animation, so I just created an animation, providing that I don't move too much the angle and so on, I can just call it today and stop here. So what I did on top of that, of course, is to match everything much better than the example I showed you. Uh, using my um, magnet tool and so on, uh, and it looks like it's uh, it's a real texture because I put some pain on to have uh, the eye, the everything that match uh, the most the close uh, cl the closest possible from uh, the the fire. Of course, the illusion shatter. If I just go back here to here and we just look the other way because you have this projection here so that's how you... that's how the back of my head looks that's fine <laughs> yeah that's something to show you to show to your children yeah. and here if we wanted to go further than that we would create other camera from here to make a coverage camera and using photoshop we just tweak the the image uh, uh, using a lot of Photoshop skill to create skin, uh, the texture of the ears and so on, uh, to have a better coverage. Of course, it will be ex extremely difficult to have something visible from every angle. This is really a trick. Uh, I insist on that, a trick to use um, when you're, you know you're only going to show part of the mesh. Of the mesh. But here, we could very easily this all this part here we could go we could change here uh, the texture rather easily change the ear and so on all this part works pretty well so on top of that i just put the original hair back so those are the hair from the original uh, character uh, using very very simple shading i just put on top on so, Lionel, to punish you for this major screw up, uh, it's terrible, Lionel, terrible. See, I'm, I'm putting the guilt. This is the method. First, you put the guilt on someone. You will have to do a university tutorial on this method and show Projection Man. So, uh, do yeah. you agree? Um, do you agree? Oh, yes, yes. There you go. So, that's how you get deals done for free as well. Uh, you get someone <laughs> to feel bad at the lowest uh, moment of their day, of their week. And you ask them to do something to remedy themselves, and they cannot refuse it. That's how you take advantage of people. <laughs> Good. Um, in case Michelle Brand is listening, we have a series coming from Lano. Free. <laughs> oh, I'm such a bad person. Sorry about that. All right. So yeah, sorry for the for the confusion. Uh... <laughs> Well, I learned something today, so I don't, yeah, you know, you should feel bad about yourself. I feel actually quite good because it's an amazing technique to, to get your 3D, uh, get some uh, computer monkey to, to do the stuff for you, and then you reproject it, and uh, that's it. I mean, that's uh, the, the good days. These are the good days. Where... And I'm going to find out what, what went wrong because, uh, yeah, this is weird. All right. Just bad luck, I guess. It's probably something very, very simple, uh, but yeah, but you have to figure it out. You owe us an explanation next week. I have to say that with a serious voice. You owe us an explanation next week, Lionel. Okay. Yeah. I will. And uh, please, people, pile on Lionel if you want him to do some free favors to us. How dare you? <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'm enjoying it. Just <laughs> don't judge me, all right? Don't judge me. I'm a mean person. I, I, I can't help it. My parents were wonderful people. I don't know why it turned out that way. <laughs> this so, is so uh, normal, though. Like, I, I will say that this is very much our lives as artists. <laughs> we go through this all the time. Oh, so yeah. It's interesting yeah. to see this happening uh, in real time. Especially uh, when you're a trainer. You, you receive all that frustration from the users. But one thing you need to understand about us trainers, we are... Um, we're odd beings. We enjoy the challenge of something and we take great pleasure when someone says, oh, thank you, you saved my day and all that. 
uh, I receive quite a lot of those things. And there's very little effort that comes uh, from us because a lot of the questions are repeat questions or it's a known problem and all that. But uh, we really enjoy doing that. And I think I speak for, for everyone. Um, uh, do you have anything else for us, Lionel? No, that's it. I'm seeing a comment from Sharon. Could you use this process for something less comp complex like buildings? Yes, it's mainly used for buildings usually. At yeah, I'm going to show. I'm going to show something like that. Yeah. It's one of the things. Uh, so I'm going to show you to a car and buildings. Yes. So shall I take the stage? Let's go, yeah. Taking the stage, uh, getting our faces out of here. Boom. So first of all, something tangential. This is uh, a demonstration of why a, a calibration or a tracker or something like that could fail. So here I have two planes. This is a very simple scene. I have plane one and plane two. So one is blue and one is red. So camera one is looking at plane one and camera two is looking at plane two. So I'll give everyone in the audience five seconds to reply. Are these planes the same or not? The same size or not? Four, three, two, one. No one replied. Everyone's just listening. You have to be more active. Oh, we have the 10 second delay from YouTube. Ha <laughs> ha, Sharon. You're wrong, Sharon. I'm going to show my face. Let me show my face. Let me, I want to do this. Sharon, you're wrong. They're not the same. So here's uh, what, what happens here. And once I go to, all right, small shift. No. All right. So you want to see the So difference? can I stop it? Can we just talk about the general rule of thumb? Whenever Thanasis asks a question <laughs> as to whether <laughs> something is simple, just the answer is no. Every time, oh. don't trust, don't don't trust him when it comes to this. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a difference. Look at this. One like, plane is four hundred by four hundred. The other plane is four hundred by fourteen hundred and forty. But because we're viewing them from different angles with different cameras, both of these look nearly identical. Now, imagine if you have a photo of this. How is a tracker or a calibrator um, able to distinguish um, the, that they're different? Because the, the, the calibrator will try to calculate the focal length, and you can see that these two cameras are very much different. The only way to do that is if you knew after this thing was calibrated, so to speak, or tracked, the distances. Uh, the way to inform a camera for a certain edge, um, if it's the, the long edge or the short edge, or what's the, the ratio between the horizontal, let's say the X axis edges and the Z axis edges, is by giving it the aspect ratio. Because in this particular case, the aspect ratio is one to one. So this is the same as this. Where in this particular case, the camera two, we have, uh, this is over um, three times longer. That's why using the constraints and uh, giving some sort of estimate of how long something is will allow the calibrator to adjust the, the camera. Now, I wanted to show this because this was one of the things where uh, visually you may think because they look identical that a camera will be able to solve these. But that's not the case. There's always an extra bit of information that's required to be able to, to solve something like this. So I just want to throw it out there to show you the massive difference between two potential camera settings when they see the same thing. And just imagine that in reverse, that a tracker sees this and tries to estimate this or this or an infinite number of intermediate points that will give you this thing. And the only thing that can distinguish uh, properly these two objects is if we had a good estimation of their width and their length. That's why whenever you're doing shots, um, live shots, make sure you get some measurements so that you can help your trackers. Okay, so uh, let's move on. I'm going to go to my cheat sheet using my other mouse and my other 
monitor over here and just get my thoughts in order. Um, Sharon commented that I have a big brain. Yes, but that big brain forgets. And that's something I can't do much about. Just okay. to say, I have found the problem, so we will see that later. Uh, let me... Solve it. Oh, right. Um, good. Uh, Lionel is going to show us the solution. So hang uh, in with us up to, to the end. So let's go back to my uh, screen. And uh, what I'm going to show you here is a car. And uh, this looks like a quasi-render, right? Doesn't it? Where in fact, this here is a 2.5D projection. And when you view it from here, we can see after a certain angle that we get the mirrors on the car. I've added uh, the wheels as uh, extra models. And you can see that the interior deforms because it's projected from the camera. And I'm going to show you very quickly how you would go about to set this up. Now, the brief, and this is a project I did in 2016 uh, for an amazing uh, Toronto-based uh, studio called Tantrum. And it was uh, for a big uh, car manufacturer. And I showed this in a presentation, but that presentation, I think it was NAB 2016, uh, disappeared. I do not know why. So this was the, the brief. They gave me, it's not this photo, this one I just pulled it from a dealer's website. Um, they gave me a photograph and they said, the customer is very happy with uh, this photograph. They don't want to change anything. It's been uh, retouched. It, they've moved some wheels around. Anyway, this is perfect. But we want to create a four-second animation where this car comes in with a spin from the side and does about 15 degrees of rotation. And this is what I had to work with. Now, uh, what they provided me with was a stock uh, 3D model of um, a car. So this was the original car here. I've done some small modifications in terms of grouping and all that. And uh, now the question becomes, how do I dress this car up with that image? And uh, this is the scope of this tutorial. So this is the image. Never forget to go to the viewport, set it to luminance, go to the viewport and set the texture preview size to no scaling. So you can see the image in the viewport without any uh, blurriness or, and sometimes uh, you will need to go here and get rid of the MIP sampling. This adds a bit of anti-aliasing. None will give you the generic anti-aliasing of uh, whatever you're rendering. If you want to render something exactly the same as it's um, in Photoshop, for example, uh, you turn off uh, those two things. Now, let's grab this and put it on the car. And uh, let's go here and create a standard camera. And all this can be translated into Redshift uh, by creating the appropriate materials, but the setup uh, should be done in standard. Now, what I'm going to do here is view from this uh, camera, and uh, I'm going to take this image, uh, select the, the, the tag, and go to projection and put the camera mapping. So I'm going to do a, a manual version of what Lionel did uh, a bit earlier. And here, the camera projection, the camera mapping allows us to, to drop a camera. There it is. And this is a frontal projection, but based on a camera. Now, why would I use frontal and why would I use um, a camera projection? Well, if you put frontal, it will be the same. But as I rotate the image, the camera always projects. And if I add another camera and view it through another camera, then I always view from the particular camera's point of view. And the frontal projection is just um, a projection from the position of the camera. But if I use a camera projection here, what I can do is I can do my standard projection here, do the calculations and all that. I'm going to show you how to adjust it in a second. And then I can view it from outside, and the projection gets stuck on the object, as you can see. So this, uh, uh, as you can imagine, gives us uh, a bit of freedom in the motion, not too much, and we may need to play with the uh, object itself uh, or the image. Now, how do I align these? Well, what I like to do is find a point, let's say this little corner here, and I'm using my navigation keys to navigate on that point and scale on that point. The other important thing is the camera 
uh, focal length. And I think for this particular case, it was around 55 millimeters. Um, I, I just did that, but trial and error, you find some parallel lines and you just estimate it. It's all eyeballing. And when you eyeball things, everyone that watches you thinks you're smarter than you are. I am. Uh, it's uh, not a coincidence, but uh, there you go. So let's assume that uh, for the sake of time, this is all I need here. There you go. So my camera now, I'm not going to use it as a viewing mechanism. I'm using the camera as a projection mechanism. So this camera's job is done. You're fired. And that was a mistake, but I like it. It emphasizes. Now I can exit this camera and add another camera, do whatever I want. And I can view this car from a series of angles. And we're going to fix a few of these things. I'm not going to fix everything. Uh, the number one thing is I want to get rid of these wheels because um, I've, uh, I'm going to in insert my, my own wheels here. I'm just going to grab, uh, oh, I think I've done that. There you go. What I did here with these wheels is I went, here they are. Uh, I went over here uh, in my uh, asset manager. Uh, I typed car and I got this car here and I stripped the wheels out and uh, scaled them to fit. That's all I did. And uh, if I make these invisible, and if I get rid of all these little lines, uh, you can see that for the visible part of the car, I'm getting a projection back here. Now, the good thing is that all these are parts of the car that are underneath. So what I can do is I can go and create a black material, and black material means a material with nothing in it, and put it on these parts, which uh, are just going to be black. So already this is looking better. And uh, this is nothing more than just a few minutes of work. Another thing I could do uh, is to go to Photoshop and mask out the background, uh, mask out the windows, create alpha channels so that the geometry is not going to be visible. It, the geometry is going to be um, uh, transparent over here. And you can create an alpha channel and use that. Or in places like this, what I did in Photoshop was I created a version where I did a very, very, very bad job uh, of um, creating this. Look, this, is my, this is my technique. I get the brush. I make sure that the opacity is 100%. And I, I do that. Good. Uh, then maybe you can go and you can say, well, I want to remove uh, this from here. So you get one of these fancy tools and you, I don't know, you alt click here and you do this and then you alt click here and you do that and then you alt click here and do that and you can see that you cannot tell that there was a side view mirror here okay and you go over here in the using the the brush and you get a green color and you paint a smiley face right and you save this and then you go back to cinema 4d and I've replaced that material with the beautiful work of art I did and reload the image. Uh, oh, it's the wrong image. So uh, let's uh, locate uh, the image or I'm going to just go and drag it from my desktop. I'm going to go in my text folder. You're not seeing that, but uh, no wheels. I'm just going to put it in here. There you go. Didn't I say that? There you go. Smiley face. So you can do um, a lot of uh, different things now. For the mirrors, uh, here's the great thing. Now you can see that everything, including the mirror, has taken this. Well, for the mirrors themselves, I can go and select them, press S to find them in here. And I'm going to bring these out and call them mirrors. And for the mirrors, I can make a copy of my car and go and load that original image. So I'm going to go and drag it over here. And I'm going to copy the texture. And uh, which one was the, this is the one with the wheels and drag this one here. So the mirrors themselves are getting that frontal projection and maybe the body of the mirror. So again, press S over here, bring this up, put this as a child, and there you go. So very quickly, and please spend a bit more than five minutes when you're doing client work, um, you can do this. You can get rid of the other mirror and you can do a symmetry, which is going to carry some of the parameters. But 
if you go and you add a bunch of wheels as well, and these tires here, I'm going to take them out from the car, or I can take this texture and apply it to everything else. And now I have uh, wheels which I can spin, and suddenly, just a few minutes, I can change uh, the, the camera, I can change my uh, lens, I need to view through this camera, I can reframe my photo, I can place this as long as I don't require, and I can hide you, you'll fire. I get a small degree of freedom here uh, just by spending, including windows and all that, maybe an hour or something like that. Uh, but it's a very powerful technique because, uh, especially with client work uh, and advertising and imaging and all that, especially with cars, it's very difficult to uh, match a photograph. And if this image has gone through the painstaking process of uh, approval uh, by uh, all sorts of uh, departments, uh, no one is going to give you the time or the money to recreate something similar, regardless how good it's going to be. So this way, you lock in the view. Now, when you rotate it, you won't get a change of reflections. But uh, really, for four seconds, no one's going to realize that. Maybe you can add some extra reflections and something like that. But uh, there you go. We can spin the, the turn the tires around. You can do this. And you can even do this. I mean, isn't that cool? You can do that on the other side of the car. Like a self-parking car that parks parallel in just 10 minutes. Okay, so uh, I hope you enjoyed this one because now I have something else to show. If you have any questions about this, please preface it with question banners. Please type question and then your question. Capitalize so we can distinguish it from the general comments, right? Have you seen it? Three, two, one. Bye-bye. So let's move on to the next one. Um, in the previous lesson, Lionel showed us the uh, camera uh, lens distortion matcher from Red Giant in After Effects. And uh, we took that very um, fisheye, I'm, I'm just opening the actual footage because I want to show you that footage. There you go. Double click on that. So you can see that this is shot with a fisheye lens and it's very dis much distorted. So Lionel uh, showed us how to undistort this just by uh, using 10, 15 clicks. And uh, then he made some um, hot air balloons and added them here. Now, the problem with those hot air balloons is that although you can place an object in this, um, there's nothing that will allow that object to receive reflections because this is a flat image uh, projected on the background. So if you have um, a sphere, and that's a cube, Right. This is a cube. If anything, that's uh, the take back for today. So if you make uh, this sphere here and you move it up, so let's go to the object mode, let's move it up. When I render this, uh, if I go and apply a mirror material, so let's just go and make a mirror material and do uh, reflectance and get rid of that and add a GGX. There you go. That's your mirror. Uh, and you render this, uh, there's absolutely nothing there. And uh, I can tell the motion tracker to create a background object. Good, render this. And again, there is nothing on the sides of my sphere. There's, it's empty, so it's not gonna receive anything. But I have enough information here to create projection planes and use this image to project it on geometry so that I can recreate part or all of the facade of the building. And of course, I hear the question, how do you do that? Well, that's my job. So this is what we will get. This is exactly what we will get if you take that undistorted footage and run the uh, automatic tracker without anything else. That's it. This is it hasn't had an extra second other than just say full track, and that's it. So let's first of all align the camera because now the camera is pointing forwards, and that's because the tracker doesn't know if that this is upwards. Um, it just points in whatever direction. Uh, the, the default is always uh, pointing towards the, the Z axis uh, or the X axis or something. No, it's a Z. So let's align this to tell it that this is the vertical. So let's go motion tracker, right click, tracker tags, and let's get a vector constraint. 
And let's go here to the vector constraint. Let's go to the track and let's make sure we are in our tracker over here and it will show us the appropriate uh, markers we have over here. Let's go to objects and here are all the, the nice little features here. And uh, let's find something that goes vertically. So I'm going to click and then I'm going to drag and then I'm going to click and then I'm going to drag. Good. And this is a Y, right? It's facing upwards. And immediately you can see the camera is pointing upwards. And we still have, you know, a bit of a shift. I don't really care. The great thing is that you can see the buildings. It's actually catching a, a sense of where the buildings are. And I find that fascinating. And uh, let's uh, add a few more things here and see uh, what happens. So that's the Y. I want to orient this side of the building to the X and this one uh, as well. So let's go and add a planar constraint. But I'm going to go to the selection. I'm not going to drag these around. I don't want to do that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go somewhere where I have plenty of these little uh, nulls over here. And uh, yep, I've got plenty of those. And these are my features. I select them first so I can see them. And then I'm going to use this, a little eyedropper. So I'm going to go and pick this and this and uh, this and this and this and this. And basically, it creates a bounding box. And uh, maybe I can create select this and this because I want the orientation as well. So I got that one. Maybe I can get this one. Or what you can do is go here and remove all. And I'm going to select something that defines some sort of rectangle. So click on this again to activate it. It was active. I'm going to take this one, this one, this one, and this one. There you go. This is the X. This plane is pointing towards the X. And immediately, we're going to get a much straighter solution because if you look in here, there you go, it points to the X. And I've got those other two lines that point to the Y. And within a few degrees, uh, I'm getting a correct solution. Now, the great thing about this is that you can create a plane. And uh, the secret is don't have this closed. Have this open, All right? Create a plane. And now we have a plane. And we can view this uh, plane if we wish to do so, but you can see it's going upwards. What can I do with this plane? Well, number one, let's select it. And, oh, I'm done with this. Let's go to object mode. Oh, it's selecting more things. Turn this off. I had that on. Anyway, nobody really cares. Uh, everything is still in place. I'm going to set this to width segments and height segments to one on one. I'm going to make it editable. And now you'll see something extraordinary. I can go to points mode, and I can start dragging the points in the direction I want them to go. So these are going to go uh, upwards. Am I in the cor correct configuration? Yeah, I'm going to go, uh, where's my up? I think my skyscrapers up is that way. So now I'm going to recreate this facade. So select this point and this point, and let's move it that away. And I can scrub along and make sure that I have the whole facade uh, selected. There you go. I'm going to go to the uh, other side, go to the end of my animation, call this. And you can see it's aligning. It's, it's uh, you know, the perspective is aligning. That means that this is not that bad. Oh, there it is. I'm going to do that. Maybe I can bring it across. I can do the knife tool. I can cut something here. I can select that edge and I can go and control copy it upwards so you will see that building follows through I can select this edge and I can pull it down I can pull it down here I can overshoot that it's not a problem good now that I have this side I can pretty much do the same thing on the other side I'm going to show you first what I'm going to do with this side and you realize what is going to happen. So I'm going to go to my motion tracker because I'm lazy and create a background object because I don't want to do it manually. And already this is the material. I don't need this. Double click on this. Do that little adjustment. Viewport, no scaling, animate preview so it animates. Uh, let's get rid of the MIP sampling. None. Excellent. And that is the material in the background. What I'm going to do, I'm also going to put it on the plane and make sure that it's set to camera mapping, and it uses the solve camera. 
and calculate that if you need to. So you won't see a big difference. Oh, the only thing you will need to change is instead of color, you can put it in the luminance. And the quick way to do it is you drag this, you hover over the luminance, and you drop it over here. There you go. Now, there are ways to do it without the luminance, but nonetheless. And everything is moving as it was before. The difference now is that this plane exists in 3D space. Look at it. It's from the camera projection perspective. I can turn off the background for a second. As far as the building is concerned, this cone, this triangle you see here, it's what's visible from the camera. And it's moving with the camera. And the effect you get from that is that it's projecting properly. But because it exists in space, we have this plane object that has actual uh, geometry. And I can always go here and say, cameras, let's get a perspective. And let's set this to raw shading. So just another camera. If I go and grab an object now, a sphere, and let's make it small. I didn't adjust the scaling for this. Uh, I could have used the vector constraint, but I don't care uh, in this particular case. If I take this sphere now and make it into a chrome ball, when I render this, it starts catching the reflection of this building. Nothing else, because there is no nothing else to catch reflections from. <clears throat> but as far as the buildings are concerned, it catches whatever I have set as geometry. So let's uh, take uh, this plane. Let's go to polygon mode. Let's select this side. And I'm going to copy it, click outside, and paste it. And it's going to create a new object with that polygon. I'm going to take this and move it to the other side. Ba, ba, ba. It's got the same material. I'm going to move it to the other side so that it aligns with one of the buildings I want. So I'm going to choose which building. So I'm going to go for this one over here. So go get your points, select these, move them so it aligns with the features. I'm going to make this bigger and close this so you can see better. Take this. Just use your proper axes to do that. So now I've created the facade of that particular building. So if I remove that, you will see it's this one over here. So let's go that way. Good. Let me undo. And we need to make sure uh, you won't see it animate unless the view is selected. Select the view, and then it will animate in that view. So make sure, even though my texture is animatable, uh, you can't see it if another window is active. I think uh, I can go and activate four views of viewport display. There's something that allows you to do all the windows, playback in all views. That should be it. So let's test this. Does it work? Oh, it. No, it doesn't work. So it says it does, but it doesn't. I think it's a known issue. But uh, nonetheless, uh, now I can just uh, play around with um, my uh, various geometries over here and just start adjusting uh, the... Oops, I, may, I shouldn't have moved that one over there. Uh, I can select these two. Let me go to polygon mode and let's uh, select brush and select. Oh, I made a mess of my polygon. How did I do that? I don't do messes. Anyway, delete this and you can go and repeat the process or I can copy this again because I think my copy paste did something rather interesting. Go back to that view over here. Good. There we go. You can always, if you get too confused, just put some constant shading over here. Constant shading, or hidden lines, sorry. Hidden lines is the best for this kind of thing. Because all I want to do here is just remove these, and I, I want one plane. That's all I want. Because that one plane, I'm going to use it to create the, the uh, other facades over here. So I can move here, I can move here, I can find these points and go and put this back to the edge of my building, select these two put this back to the edge of my building, and that's going to follow along. Make sure this is your active view. And you can align these uh, points so that they align with the edge of your building. There we go.
good. I can take these two points and move them up. And you, you shouldn't care much about the details because this is just for capturing uh, reflections. Now we have this building. We can make a copy of this. I can go and uh, move it to the appropriate uh, position over here. So I can go to the uh, towards the minus Z. And you can see we're using our tracking points to bring it approximately to the right position. You, I'm viewing this as I'm moving it around to, to bring these parallel. It's still going to be moving properly. We won't see the update yet. Now we're going to see the update. I can take this edge and move it so that it aligns with that other edge over there. So I can uh, go here and move this around until it touches that side. Then I can get this edge and move it up until it goes all the way up. And uh, basically, this is the way you would go about creating reflector planes. And now we have all the buildings reflecting properly. Now, we don't have a road, which is behind the camera. You can use some stock footage and put it on a plane behind the camera so that it reflects some streets or something like that. But for the purpose, I'm going to press Alt-R to create the interactive render region. I'm going to make this bigger. This is how you go and you recreate uh, geometry uh, so that you can create uh, reflector planes and make sure that your scene has enough uh, information uh, so that you can uh, composite things with reflections on them. And you can rebuild uh, pretty much uh, anything, anything you want. There's no shortage of uh, uh, building things. I'm just going to put linear. I'm going to put it on the, I think, the Z. Turn this off. Oops. Alt. Uh, what was I trying to do? Alt R. That was what I was trying to do. Well, these Windows uh, keyboard shortcuts, they always uh, confuse me. Uh, I can add more than one spheres. Good. Just going to make sure that this is in the same position as that. I press Shift. I want to press Alt. What's wrong with me? There you go. That's better. So now I can have a bunch of spheres. There you go. And they will all catch the appropriate reflections, depending on their position. And they will align with whatever you do here. So I think I have the a final version I did here. Well, I didn't do all the buildings. I think I did more for you. But uh, this is um, uh, mainly the technique. Make sure that you have your tracking points um, or your, your features that will inform you on the shape of various objects. And it's amazing how even in a shot like this, that shouldn't work because of all the reflections. And yet, Cinema Vodice Tracker manages to give you uh, a good amount of uh, information. And you can use these facades any way you want. You can, uh, you can go to, let's say, After Effects and uh, use your compositing skills uh, to make little uh, windows that have light. Or you can do that in Cinema 4D because now that we have this bunch of objects, I think this is the original object here. Let me go, yep, that's the original object. Uh, you can use modeling tools and start cutting down. I'm just hovering over this, and you can see that pretty much the perspective is not that bad. Yeah, maybe it's off here, but then you can just go and move one of the points. And then you can do this. And then you can create, you can select a, a one of the windows and, and add some sort of uh, emissive uh, material if you want to make it uh, emit light that it's a night scene or something like that but nonetheless there's no shortage of things you can do once you align these uh, properly and you have your facades and uh, with that little thing uh, yeah if there are any questions I'm going to show our beautiful faces here da -da -da -da. No, let's see if there everyone, are any everyone is turned Let's see. Oh, uh, you've answered all the questions. Okay. What if you need to change the car's color? Yeah, go to Photoshop. All right.
Here's a tip for cars. One of the things you cannot do is take any colored car and change it to any color. That will not work. The only way to recolorize a car, so for example, you can't take a black car and turn it into a white car. That will not work. You'll have to literally repaint the whole thing by hand. You cannot take a white car and turn it into a black car. It's going to look odd. If you ever get a project where you need to recolor a car, and this is not related to our subject, but it's very important, request the car that's in one of the three primary colors, red, green, or blue. Because other than uh, the, the way reflections, uh, the, the pres when you have a normal car with a coating, your reflections are pretty much the same, regardless of if you're in a red, green, or blue car. And when you shift those hues, any reflections that need to change color will change color. But the biggest problem with black, white, gray colors and all that of cars is that they lack the saturation. As long as you have, if you take a perfectly lit red car, and actually what I'm going to do, because it's fun, I'm going to share my screen once again here and uh, see if I can do that. If you have this and you want to make it, let's say, green, well, that's uh, pretty simple. You just make it green. That's it. Now, this is not the best green, but when you have a primary color, you can change the colorization of, of your car because the whites remain white and so forth. If you have a gray color, a gray car, so let's assume that this was your original image. Unless you do very heavy masking and all that, there's absolutely no way you can add color to this. So, so can, I inter can I interject a second? Yeah, play it, please. So... Uh, in the hue and saturation, you see the little hand. Uh, you, you can oh. actually go back to your screen. Um, I actually don't know if I can open it. We'll see. Sure, the little it. hand here. So yeah, there's a little hand, and so if you if you reset the entire thing, uh, if you re reset the entire adjustment layer uh, down at mm -hmm. the bottom, there's a reset. Oh, uh, down the bottom the arrow. Uh, on the bottom the of the uh, yeah. Yeah, Nick, the, the, oh yeah, this this <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Uh, so good. if you select the red, uh, select one of your midtone reds uh, using here? the little eye, or sorry, not the eye, the little hand uh, picker. Yep. So this if you select picker. that and then click on one of the midtone reds, okay. So that's automatically going to change your color to red, and then you can use uh, those handles down at the bottom. Uh, if, <laughs> if you use those and you can feather out left and right, so this is only going to increase, uh, the selection. So usually you only want to keep it in that one color, um, you know, in that color range there. So you, you kind of go like highlight to shadow type of deal and you can move, uh, left and right and select that. Nice. Uh, but what that allows you to do is actually decrease the saturation and the lightness of just that color um so nice. you can drop the saturation um you know and adjust the hues and everything so this is actually you know how i would go about this process if i wanted to make a red car black or white you know or gray um shiny brown th this is the process that you would do so you you can do it um, I definitely would urge people to look into that. Maybe that's a YouTube video I should put out here. Um, but you can definitely take, you know, any color and, and adjust it. The hard part is where you start to get into more complex colors, uh, especially with automotive paint. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. That's you know, into that, the pearlescence yeah. and, and, you know, opalescence, things like that. That's a bit but, more tricky, but a black car cannot be colorized and a white car cannot be colorized. Do you agree to that? I, I don't agree, <laughs> but I'm also like, I'm a Photoshop guy, so I would wait, wait. I would start working with gradient maps at that point. No, 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 no. That, that's not no, no. Anything that takes more than five minutes is out of the question. You cannot directly recolorize a black or a white car because white on white, you you won't 
as you said, you need to go and actually manually uh, create the the color gradients. You cannot. Yeah, it's not. It. It's not always a fast process. So uh, there you, be, okay. be prepared to spend some time. It's off the table. <laughs> off off the table. No, no fast process off the table. So uh, that was my uh, little tip about recolorizing and so forth. Uh, what else? Uh, what else uh, do you, well, you have? I would because... like to show uh, my uh, problem here. It's it was very yes. easy yeah. on, on the because I cannot I cannot leave you uh, with uh, such uh, such a mess. So here it doesn't work, uh, obviously, because I forgot this tiny little. Uh, I was going to say bad word. This material pin material tag uh, stick texture so yes it's going to stick the texture even though i deformed everything you just delayed this thing uh, and now it works that's all there you go that's it it was a tiny thing always okay it so do, do me a favor do me a favor uh extend your your left arm please your left arm extend your left arm no, all right that one extend it towards the the left Right. Extend it towards the left. Well, it's going to be blurred. Okay, so I'm going to try and, and do that. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to do that so I can slap your hand. Right. Don't forget the the, the pin thing. Okay. Oh yeah. Yeah. See, that's why I need um, uh, an assistant that will pretend when they put their hand out that it's your hand, so I can smack it. Uh, Dustin, can you raise your your hand, please? Which, which, which the other hand? one, the other one, the other one. Okay, so uh, raise your left hand more, 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 more outside the screen. Oh, hold on, hold on. There you hold go. On. You have to there go. You go. That, that's it. There you, you go. have to go there. There we go. There you go. Yeah. Feel that? Feel that? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I think we're done for for the day. Uh, let me see if I, because with all this uh, these shenanigans, I may forget um, the preamble. Let's go and uh, share my. Let me find the screen so I can take you through. There we go. Closing housekeeping. There we go. So, um, events page. Go to the events and check out what's going on. Number two, Maxon Training Team YouTube channel. All the fun stuff. And the Maxon YouTube channel as well. Maxon certifications. Become a pro certified user or a certified trainer. Training is great. Mentoring is great. So it's a, a good training. When you become a trainer, you learn more about your trade uh, than uh, using it to do things. Because one thing is about just doing stuff, coming to a, a final uh, point, whereas training, you do all the in-between. So uh, go and watch the design animation tour. Um, yes, uh, there's some interesting presentations going on with some fantastic people over here. And don't forget to go and grab your swag and uh, use the code. Where are the banners? They are compositing 3D for the whole. Oops, I pressed the wrong one. How did I do that? There you go, composting 3D. And uh, that will give you the ability to get some free swag and just pay for, uh, for shipping and handling. We really take care of the stuff. We handle them gently. And uh, yeah, don't forget to go to uh, Udemy and use Lionel's uh, promo code so that you will get um, a hefty uh, discount and go and watch uh, the tutorials by our good friend Dustin and go to his website and see what he has to offer. And uh, next week, we are going to continue the subject where I'm going to take a back seat next week, and I'm just going to annoy uh, Dustin and Lionel. So I'm going to have a lot of free time, an hour and a half, to just annoy them. So that, that's going to be a fun one. Um, yeah. I'm sure you won't disappoint. <laughs> well... If I don't get you annoyed, that's a very difficult thing because you're both very calm, very collected uh, human beings. And uh, I'm going to have uh, my task cut out for me. So, yeah, um, that's all we have. Uh, send your questions to us, a trainer at maxon.net for proposals and questions for future uh, Ask the Trainer and uh, Demystifying 
uh, post-production uh, series. I hope you enjoyed today's show and uh, we'll see you in a few days. Have a great week, everyone. Bye-bye to my beautiful bye -bye. hosts yeah. here. Bye, and everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carl, for uh, producing. And uh, yeah, see you on the flip side. Bye-bye.